Welcome to Series 5 of the Lawyer's Coach podcast. My name is Oliver Hansard, and each episode of this podcast will feature myself or Claire Rayson, both of us coaches and former lawyers, trying to find out what makes lawyers tick. In this series, we will be hearing from various guests and experts, exploring the skills that lawyers need to succeed. And then, at the end of each episode, we will both be reflecting on what they said. The Lawyer's Coach podcast is brought to you by Client Talk and Hansard Coaching. In this episode, Claire Rayson talks to Helen Lowe, who's Head of Legal Operations at EasyJet. Helen demonstrates how an innovative pitch process really sets up a great working relationship with private practice lawyers. So Helen, thank you for joining us. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. So we always start these um, these episodes by finding out a little bit about our guests' journeys. And I was having a look at your CV and I noticed that you went from auditor to uh, Hot 100 lawyer. So tell me a little bit about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite sure how the journey happened. Um, I, I think at one point I was, I was deemed broadly unemployable by recruitment consultants because they weren't quite sure what to do with me. Um, so I joined KPMG um, back in the good old days in 2003 when they offered an MBA. When I left KPMG, I moved to Sellafield, who was actually a former client and worked on a programme there. And as anybody who's worked in the public sector will know, projects and programmes in the public sector are a whole beast. Sellafield is on the west coast of Cumbria, though, and quite often you end up on the Isle of Man um, mobile phone network if you drift a little bit too far into the car park. Um, and I decided it was a little bit too remote for me. Um, and so I came back to Manchester to work at the co-op. And that was really where my journey into... Um, legal operations started I can remember um, I'd applied for a finance role actually at the co-op as the organization was really struggling following the collapse of the bank or near collapse of the bank Um, and um, and that role was actually filled internally but they said you know like every recruiter says they said oh you know we'll just we'll keep your details on file and I thought well that's the last I'll ever hear from them and then they phoned me up and they said we've got this job in the legal department I was like well I'm not a lawyer you know good dad kind of fundamental to a legal department surely and um, it was Jim Tully who was a a former partner at Adelshaw Goddard was reshaping the legal team as the whole organization was being restructured and he had experienced um, working with what he called a business manager and so he wanted to recruit someone who had a completely different skill set to the rest of the legal team so somebody who came with a more commercial business focused corporate um, mindset rather than that kind of legal lens and that legal focus to really kind of bring a different dimension to his leadership team and I sat in the interview and um, I can remember having prepared entirely for their for an interview with their business facing or customer facing um, legal team so they've got a, a co-op legal services business um, and I had prepared manfully for working with conveyancing and probate and everything else and I had no idea what an in-house legal team was and uh, and I said you realize my only encounter with the law is a speeding ticket I know nothing about this um, and so it was really a crash course I was successful um, in in securing the job and it was an absolute crash course in learning about the law I was literally going around and saying to people what does a commercial lawyer do um so I that was you know really really interesting and then the opportunity at EasyJet came up and Micah was at the helm of the legal team and you know I knew all of the great work that she'd done at Royal Mail and so for me it was just a fantastic opportunity to build even further on the experience that I gained at the co-op um working with a completely different team easyj is such a different organization it's so much more dynamic and energetic um you know the, the co-op is a really exciting place to be a part of uh, but easyjet is is as anybody who's worked there it's another level <laughs> <laughs> and i imagine you've got you've you know had a, a well a bumpy couple of of years as well with covid really hitting your industry hard it has. It's been really tumultuous. I think it's taught us a lot about the organisation. But, you know, have you seen the, the role of the legal team or how the legal team has, uh, you know, seen within the business change over the over the last couple of years? I think absolutely. You know, the all of the team, EasyJet's got a phenomenally embedded legal team. So they are really part of the business. Um, but they don't just have a place at the table anymore. 
they have absolutely got a voice at the table and it's a powerful voice um and you know i think it's it's now less about oh god we need legal in this and, and much more about legal or our partner in this and we need them to bring their voice and their guidance and their advice to make sure that this is is happening i'm going to talk to you a bit about advisors because it's the thing that that attracted me to you and and the reason why i asked you to join this um join the podcast but before I move on to the pitch, which is if for those that haven't heard about it, they're going to love it. But thinking about your advisors, do you think that they've noticed the shift in positioning of the legal team and, and, and have responded equally? I think they've absolutely noticed the shift. And I would say that most of them have responded equally. Um, they've, you know, they've been by our sides right the way through and we have lent on them very very heavily um especially i mean you know we're a plc so everything we do is out there in the in the big wide world um and so you know it's it's no secret the refinancings that we've done where we've had partners right by our sides all the way through that even in the dead of night when we're frantically trying to finalize documents um i think there are some elements where we still need firms to step up to the plate um, and really see that the advice that they give us needs to go straight into the business. If we ask for a paragraph of, of guidance or advice, that's all we want. We don't want 16 pages that we've then got to turn into a paragraph. Um, you know, if we ask for bullet points, we do want bullet points. We know that you're hearing bullet points and thinking, you know, chapter and verse, but, um, you know, we want bullet points. And I think, you know, we're being very clear for the most part we get it wrong sometimes absolutely but for the most part we're pretty clear in what our requirements are um particularly when it's something that has to go back through to the business uh, and i think really you know it's it, that's the real kind of sticking point i think it's very difficult to pull law firms away from the comfort of justifying their fees through many many pages of work <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's funny. I, I do lots of client listening exercise and it's something that I hear again and again. And, and yeah, it, it's it's yeah, it's astonishing, isn't it? That, you know, that that ability to be simple. And actually, I know simplicity is one of the things that you talk about. I always think about you only really know you understand something when you can explain it to a five year old. It's really, really counterintuitive, I think, for a lot of people who are professionally trained. And I absolutely include accountants in that as well. I once did a half a million pound piece of work um, for a company and my entire file was three sheets long um, three sheets of A4 and that was it that was all I produced because what I was working on was really tangible and it was in the office um, of the client and it was up on the walls it was it was basically a PMO it was you know up on the walls timelines work streams everything else and so there was like two bills and like the front page of an engagement letter on this file and um, you know people were kind of like well, how have you justified those fees? And I'm like, well, I don't have to justify the fees through paper. Mm -hmm. And part of it is that I'm inherently lazy. I said it in my interview to Micah. I am <laughs> absolutely, if there is a, an easier way to do things, I will find it. And that's what makes me good at what I do. And it's what mm -hmm. makes me good at simplifying language. And it's what makes me good at simplifying processes is that fundamentally, I just kind of want an easy life. Mm. <laughs> But also, you know, I think I think I think you're not alone. And, you know, and it's interesting what you're saying, because actually it's about how do lawyers demonstrate value and where you're forcing your advisors to move away from showing value through 16 pages. Yeah, absolutely. And I and I have shared with many a law firm my advice on sending emails to anybody in the business um, or even drafting notes um, to anybody in the business. And that is go into an office which is a little bit harder now, but also weirdly easier. Um, go into an office and read it out loud. And if you are not comfortable reading those words out loud and they don't sound like a chat that you would have with a friend, then it's not fit to be sent to the business. So, you know, to me, that's a really great test. If you're hearing your voice and be like, oh God, you know, that's the 16th <laughs> syllable in that word, I should probably step away. Um, then, you know, it's not, it's not ready. And it's a great test because as soon as you read something out loud, you're like, oh, crikey, you know, this doesn't sound good. Great advice. And it, I am going to now bring it onto the pitch because having sat in the law firm, many law firms with a BD hat on, I have I have had to uh, respond to many pitches and they are invariably painful. So when I saw yours, I did think finally a pitch that I want to be involved in. So for those that haven't heard, do you want to give a little bit of background in terms of what you did and why you did it? Absolutely. So um, 
So I guess the first part of it is the RFP document, the request for proposal. And that was fairly standard. I say fairly standard because I rewrote it using pretty much all of the same content, but writing it in my style, which coincidentally happens to be very easy jet style um, of writing. And that document went out. I can remember it very vividly because it was my first deadline with EasyJet because I didn't been with the company two months. Um, and it was 17th of February. And the deadline was six weeks later for the responses. And obviously everybody knows what happened in that six week period. We all got sent home, the fleet was grounded. And, and unsurprisingly, responding to my precious RFP <laughs> did not rank highly on all of these <laughs> organizations <laughs> list. <laughs> um, so everything was kind of postponed until June. Um, in terms of responses and we got everything back um, and we scored everything we worked as a team to score everything and then we kind of sat back and reflected and we thought right number one is who on earth knows what what is happening with covid because it was also up in the air june july time 2020 what is going on um then we also sat back and we thought you know we're entering what should be summer holiday season um, so people want to spend time with their families. If we can get them away on an easy jet flight, we want them flying on an easy jet flight. We want people to not feel like they're being pulled between preparation for something and spending time with their family or trying frantically to catch up on homeschooling or whatever obligations uh, people have got. And so we sort of sat back and we thought, let's do this differently. We've got a great opportunity. We're going to have to do it all via Zoom or Teams or you know your platform of choice. Um, so let's think about how we can structure this differently give it some kind of shape um but also get the value that we want out of it and what was really important to us wasn't people's legal credentials um it was very very much what how they worked together how they were going to work with us and what their approach was to challenges so we structured something um that was quite hopefully quite innovative quite exciting quite different um the first part of it was that they had to do a video and that was that video is what opened up the interview section um and it that was probably the most challenging bit of it because we did settle in that challenge in lockdown so there was a lot of very disconnected people um you know standing in an office next to snowboards or, or you know out looking after horses with a mask on um and so it was all you know it, but it was the idea was that you're not going to be able to bring loads of people onto a, a team's call we have to get experience of your organization and who you guys are without being in your offices and without seeing how you are on a day-to-day -day basis and so that was really the purpose of the video was to give us a flavor of what the wider organization was like um, then we sent them some voicemail tests and we sent them some emails the day before we met with them so that was timed all the way through the week that people would get a mail shot 24 hours before we were due to meet with them and they were three requests usually um and they were kind of fairly standard the things anybody had sent out from a business you know i need some help with this can you just give me a quick you know heads up on what key issues i need to look out for and we asked them to do it in the interview process as if they were leaving a voicemail for the business and so what we were really testing there was can they keep to time the answer is no <laughs> can they keep it really straightforward Often the answer is no, um, but it gives you a real sense of what they think the priority is, what are the messages they're trying to get across really quickly, um, and how effectively can they communicate those headline issues and things that people should be worrying about. And you know, the, the real test for that was if I'm kind of switching off, then it's probably gone on a little bit too long, as, as I'm definitely not a lawyer. Um, you know, for me, it was kind of, you know, if I'm starting to hear noise, then chances are the business is going to be starting to hear noise. Um, and obviously the rest of the legal team were there. Uh, we had representatives from across the, the team on every um, interview to check and see how, how legal the advice was. Um, and then um, probably the standout bit was um, the Himalayas exercise. And this was to understand how they collaborated as a team, how they approached a problem and whether or not they really got what we wanted. We did not share this with them before we met with them. We shared it in the meeting as we were briefing them on the exercise. Um, so it went to the lead partner, it was cascaded through the team and the EasyJet team switched off our cameras, we switched off our um, microphones and we just sat there and we had a separate Skype channel and we observed and we watched for the behaviours that we were testing, which were against the O-shaped lawyer attributes. Um, and we were testing 
um, how they all reacted to that. We were there in case they had any questions, but for the most part, they were very much on their own. And the idea was that they were lost in the Himalayas. And so, you know, they were stranded there. They had a backpack with a few bits and pieces in, notably brandy, um, which everybody pretty much went for without fail. Um, and then they were set five predicaments. It's a much broader exercise, actually. It's about an hour and a half exercise, but we only wanted something quite short. Um, and um, so we chose these five predicaments and, and the challenge was, you know, work as a team, come up with your answers um, and then present them back to us. And it was really fascinating seeing how the different organisations responded to that challenge. Some were panicking before we even got through the door. You know, which legal specialism should I bring? You don't need any. I don't care about your legal training. You know, if you are working for the magic circle, the silver circle, you know, whoever it is, you, your credentials are already locked in you know you're you are good at what you do what I care about is whether or not I'm going to absolutely dread that phone ringing with your name popping up on it and that's that's the real test of what we were looking for is you know how commercial are they do they do they involve everybody in that conversation or you know is the partner absolutely dominating the whole thing you know somebody dissents how do they how do they discuss that point between them and come to a conclusion um and so it was it was fascinating to observe I mean, it's it's genius, <laughs> and I would I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall yeah. thinking to some teams I've been in the differences I can imagine. I mean, so many questions. How did it land? Yeah, how did it land? Let's go with that first. So, across <laughs> the majority of the firms that we worked with, it landed really, really positively. You know, I'd set the tone right the way through. So, all of the they got these regular Friday updates from me all the way through the process, saying this is what you can expect next. This is what we're up to on this, um, and they very much set our expectation in terms of what we were looking at and how we were expecting to approach these things. So, I don't think I think everybody knew to expect the unexpected. Um, and actually, the feedback that we got following it was so pretty much overwhelmingly positive. They enjoyed it. They appreciated the fact they didn't have to spend hours crafting, you know, the most beautiful PowerPoint deck on the planet to present to us and making sure all our handoffs on Teams were bang on. There was none of that. Um, they just got to come in and be themselves. And for some of them, that wasn't quite as comfortable as they would like. But I think overwhelmingly that you know the feedback was we actually enjoyed being pushed a little bit out of our comfort zone we enjoyed being asked to do something different we enjoyed being tested in a different way rather than you know somebody coming to us and asking us tell us more about how you how you formulate this commercial response you know there was there was kind of none of that and so I think it's there were a couple of firms that struggled with it and found it really really hard um and you know unsurprisingly they're not part of our panel mm. And in terms of the panel, and, and you mentioned O-Shaped Lawyer there, and we had Natalie Salunke from the O-Shaped Lawyer on series, I think it was series two. It's something I'm quite passionate about, and I, I hate the term soft skills because I think they become devalued, but empathy, understanding who you're working with, emotional intelligence, so, so important and so often not valued in, in the same way as other things in law firms. Has the exercise that you've done with firms shifted how they are now viewing those skills? I think it has, yeah, because I think what it's demonstrated is that it is embedded in the way that we think and the way that we expect them to think when they're working on matters with us. I mean, we have, we didn't just stop there. We have golden rules for them that we set out as at the outset of, of you know, and some of that is around, you know, boring things like fees. Um, but, you know, other bits are around, you know, how they communicate with us, when they communicate with us, you know, what style should they use when they can, you know, emphasise the fact they can always approach us with any questions. You know, they shouldn't just sit there in isolation thinking they should know the answers because they're the law firm. Um, so we kind of have that. We also have sent them on tone of voice training as part of everything that they're doing. We've requested that they um, do tone of voice training. We run six monthly legal community check-ins uh, where we share everything that's going on with the business and they can share um, how they are um, going to a, kind of approach some of our business challenges. So it has been, you know, really embedded in everything that we do. And I think it's really driving that different approach that we're really seeing from some of our law firms. Absolutely. And I know part of it is collaboration within the, the team, collaboration with you. 
Um, I want to ask two questions about collaboration. And one is collaboration across firms, because I know you will have several firms on your panel. And again, I know a frustration when I talk to clients is, you know, we receive the same piece of advice when there's a new alert or something. We get it five times and we've got to try and read the five things. How do you try and drive collaboration across the firms that, that are on your panel? I will hold my hands up and say we have absolutely not nailed this. We, we, you know, we are making steps and we are getting to the right place. We've got them working together on some challenges. And this year, we're really looking at how we can get a lead partner group working together to address some of the challenges. Um, but we haven't knocked it out of the park. We do still get the same updates uh, quite often from multiple people. But what we ask of them is that they come back to us with a so what for EasyJet. So we, anything that is generic, um, and just comes out as a mail shot will usually just be deleted pretty much universally by the team. But what we request is for them to put a lens on it that says, knowing you as we do, what does this mean for the organization? Um, and so that's how we've started to pull that together. And so, you know, the, the next step for me is starting to think about how we can use technology to leverage that collaboration um and make it a bit easier for all of the firms as well and you know some of the firms have been super proactive and have come to me and i have stalled with the ideas because i've run out of hours in the day um to get things done um but you know technology can absolutely be used to leverage this and i think the other really critical piece of getting firms to collaborate together is really going to be this kind of partners group where we get them to network together to think about how to challenge um us as an organization and how to challenge each other and play to their strengths and that was very much what we asked them to do as part of the, um, the the legal community interview process was play to their strengths. Don't try and, you know, if you are magic circle, don't try and sell us on you doing our, you know, £5,000 contracts because it's simply not your, your, your strength. Um, so absolutely, you know, playing to their strengths and getting the partner group thinking about that is, is I think, really important to collaboration. And do you think the partner group see that in the spirit that it's intended, which is actually you all working together will make our lives easier and therefore you will all be able to give us the best advice as a group? Or, or, or does the competitiveness come out is where I'm thinking, you know, they, <laughs> I'm part of this group, but I'm going to be the one that leads with the idea. <laughs> I think, it's, you know, what I think it's really interesting because I think there is always going to be an element of that. There is always going to be somebody who is deeply, deeply uncomfortable with being put in that position. Um, but you know, we're not asking them to share what charge out rates they've agreed with us. We don't want commercially sensitive information to be shared between them. This is client service stuff that we're looking at. We're not looking at, you know, if we're, if we're asking them to both work on a deal together, that will be, you know, that will be segregated and taken away. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about client service. And so to me, actually them being pushed a bit harder isn't a bad thing because there's a lot of law firms that talk about client service and a lot of law firms that think, oh, you know, we're great at it. But the reality is very, very different um, when you're on the receiving end of it and actually pushing them a little bit harder to think a little bit more. And we all work better when we're pushed outside of our comfort zones. And, you know, the greatest ideas come from talking to people outside of those we would normally talk to. And so the reality is that sticking nine lead partners in a room together, I mean, you know, part of me wants to have the kind of St. John's ambulance on standby, but, <laughs> um, but you know, putting them in a room together to come up with some creative ideas for how they can support EasyJet as an organisation, I think has to be the way forwards because that's what the legal community is all about. Yeah, tied to that, I guess. And that was the other thing I was thinking about collaboration. And, and, you know, imagine you being, you know, where we started this conversation, you being a non-lawyer, but in a in a legal team and being able to ask some of those questions that probably don't get asked because it's just how we've always done things. You've clearly made a huge difference. Are you seeing that in law firms too? So are you seeing law firms really embracing the wider community, for want of a better word, that's mm. in the law firms and bringing those in? And is that something that you advocate? Absolutely. Absolutely, because I think that groupthink is such a dangerous trap to fall into. And we've all done it and we all do it probably every day. Um, but groupthink, it doesn't help businesses to grow and succeed and it doesn't help individuals to grow and succeed. So I think it's absolutely vital that there are different voices at the table and different people participating in the way that we approach things. Absolutely. You know, one of the greatest assets I have is that I have not got a clue what a lawyer's life is like nor do I terribly much want to have a clue what a lawyer's life is like but it does mean that sometimes I can just 
you know, bundle in there and approach something as I would with any other organization. I don't have, I have a huge amount of respect for the people that we work with, um, but I'm also not so desperately respectful that I won't pick up the phone to a partner and say, what on earth are you billing three times the amount we agreed? You know, you had a fixed fee and you didn't call us and let us know you were going over it. So, you know, we're not paying. I'm not, you know, that to me is them being disrespectful to us. It's not me being disrespectful to them. And so I will pick up the phone and I will have those conversations. And sometimes I will kind of push things a bit harder and I will say, you know, actually, we're going to approach this differently. We're going to try something new. And, you know, I think it's really important that we have those different voices at the table. And I don't think that it's vital that a legal ops person is a non-lawyer. I think there are some brilliant lawyers doing this role. Um, but what I do think that a legal ops person should always bring is a different perspective and a challenging voice and somebody who looks at things through a different lens. Mm, I couldn't, couldn't agree more. And again, thinking about, you know, having had business development roles in law firms and actually I am a lawyer as well. So I've quite got different hats. But yeah, bring, bringing a different perspective is so important. I want to ask one last question around skills, which is loosely the theme for the... <laughs> For the uh, for the series, and we've touched on skills, and we've kind of mentioned O-shaped lawyer a bit, and and different things that lawyers need to be thinking about. What would your advice be to to law firms listening in terms of the skills that they should really be focusing on developing in their in their lawyers right from the get go? Absolutely. So I think the first one to me is to be human. It's really easy when you go through all of this training to kind of pop out like a little lawyer robot at the end um and we don't want that you know most clients want real people who understand their problems can empathize with the challenges that they're facing into and can share and are the people that they pick up the phone to when things are going a little bit badly um or even when things are going a little bit well and want to celebrate a bit of success um so i think that's humanity and empathy um I think the next one, I think it'd be remiss not to mention commerciality because Lord knows, you know, the law is not commercial. Lawyers need to be commercial because they need to translate all of this, you know, years of, I'm going to get all of this wrong, but like precedent and case law and whatever else has happened into the 21st century in a dynamic environment where we're facing into a pandemic and we are trying to work out how to stay within the boundaries of what is permitted whilst also you know delivering everything that we need to deliver as an organization and I think so that commerciality um, and that commercial approach is, is absolutely vital um, and collaboration I think it comes back to that group think piece it's about pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone it's about you know working with legal designers it's about working with legal ops people it's about thinking about how um, you know, ALSPs in the big four are delivering that comprehensive service and how you could potentially tap into some of that approach. I think it's about collaborating and thinking bigger than just big law. That was Claire Rayson talking to Helen Lowe, Head of Legal Operations at EasyJet. Claire, great conversation. What really leapt out at you during that conversation? So I was so excited to be able to speak to Helen because right at the beginning of, of the pandemic, um, when I saw the headlines about sending lawyers off to the Himalayas, I just thought it was brilliant. And two years later, it was just so um, interesting to find out how it landed with clients, uh, to hear from her about what difference it's made and to think about the different things that she's still um, looking for, to her lawyers to, to do and to achieve. And that innovative way of selecting the law firms has kind of really stood the test of time. You really get the sense that they got the lawyers they wanted as a result of that process. Yeah, and I think what's interesting for, you know, as long as I've been in law, the rhetoric has always been that clients want more than just good lawyers um, if you go to a city firm a magic circle firm a US firm you know that the credentials are there you know that everyone's had a stellar training in the firm that they're in so to actually put to one side some of the questions around um, technical ability and to focus on the things that really make a difference. You know, do I want to be in the room with this person late at night when we're trying to hammer out a deal? What a brilliant way to actually recognise what is important and what does make a difference. 
and really put them out of their comfort zone from the very beginning because that's probably the place they're going to get to during a working relationship with a client absolutely and thinking about how we respond under pressure I and mean, pitches arguably are a pressure situation anyway but putting them in a situation where really they couldn't prepare where uh you know they absolutely would have ended up showing um showing their hand showing how they managed a team showing how they work in a team just brilliant and you know I really came away enthused after talking to Helen the message for me that I came away with which again is something that I've heard throughout my legal career and and so frustrating perhaps that clients still have to say it but you know give us advice that we can just forward on internally to the business give us simple advice speak in plain language just things that I think can't be said enough because I think the impact is just huge when you get it right thanks for that Claire that was a great conversation and a fantastic episode really appreciated Next up on the Lawyers Coach podcast, I have the pleasure of speaking to Sarah McCarthy, Chief Legal Officer at Dunhumby. Thanks for listening and goodbye. Lawyers Coach is brought to you by Client Talk and Hansard Coaching. If you're enjoying this series, please rate us on your podcast provider so that others can find us. If you're a lawyer and would like to take part in Lawyers Coach, please visit our website, lawyercoach.co.uk, for further details. And you can also join the conversation on our LinkedIn group, Lawyers Coach. If there are any topics you'd like to hear us discuss, then just get in touch.